everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Katie Bow. I'm the Senior National Security Correspondent here at Defense One, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the second event in this year's virtual edition of our annual Outlook Summit. This year's event looks a little different than last year's, not just because it's being streamed out of my living room, and will feature a series of virtual one-on-one -on -one interviews with defense and global security leaders on the news of the day, what to expect in the year ahead, and the future of defense acquisitions and technology. Before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. In the top right-hand corner of your screen, you will find a message icon. That's where you can chat and interact with your fellow attendees or ask for technical assistance. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to General Frank McKenzie, Commander of the United States Central Command, for some brief opening remarks. Thanks so much for, for being with us, General McKenzie. Katie Bo, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I, this is a great opportunity. I think it's very important for U.S. military leaders to engage with the media and, and the public to explain our operations and our efforts to secure the nation. We are funded by and swear an oath to defend the citizens of this nation, and this, make a, this makes events like this an essential part of providing America an understanding of what the U.S. military is actually doing. So I'm going to begin and just make some brief remarks. I'm not going to talk about what CENTCOM is, where it is, because I believe everyone has a pretty good understanding of that. Instead, I'm going to talk about our interests in the U.S. Central Command region and my priorities. And then I'm going to talk briefly about one of those priorities, and it may not be the one you would expect me to emphasize. Uh, but the United States has two critical interests in the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility. First, maintaining and improving security and stability of the region, including the freedom of navigation. And second, eliminating the terrorist threat to the homeland, which emanates from the region. So under those high level interests, we operationalize what we do in the region by establishing priorities. Here are my five priorities. First, deterring Iranian aggression. Second, supporting the Afghan peace negotiations and achieving a negotiated settlement to the conflict in Afghanistan. Third, maintaining pressure on ISIS. Fourth, working with the wider Department of Defense community on counter unmanned aerial systems. And fifth, addressing the fate of refugees and displaced persons in the region. So I'm happy to talk about any of those as we get into the questions, but I, what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time talking about the fifth one, which is the IDP issue. And it's not a problem you'd particularly expect me to talk about, but I think the long-term consequences of not tackling the problem of displaced persons and refugees is going to be is going to is going to have enormous long-term negative ramifications for the region, and not only the region but actually global implications. Today, across the CENTCOM region, wherever you find conflict, you'll find internally displaced persons, and you'll find refugees who fled violence. Wherever you find IDPs and refugees, and I'll use IDPs as a shorthand term for internally displaced persons, you'll find distress and suffering. Local communities often bear the brunt of supporting IDPs and refugees many times for years on end. And while coalition donors and international relief organizations provide tremendous support to large IDP and refugee populations in the region, long-term solutions remain elusive as long as the underlying conflicts remain. Beyond the suffering and the human toll, there's the potential for IDP and refugee camps to become fertile ground for the propagation of radical ideologies. Large camps in Syria in particular have become areas of systemic indoctrination of IDPs and refugees who are hostages to the receipt of ISIS ideology. This is a larger strategic problem and it's not gonna be addressed by military means. Instead, it requires global resources along with regional and local government commitment to resolve. The repatriation of foreign fighters and families and the reintegration of IDPs and refugees into their home communities is in the best interest of the international community and it's vital to the interest of those people who are currently in the camps. Unless we find a way to do this, a way to repatriate and reintegrate into home communities and support uh, reconciliation solutions for conflict victims, many of whom have been in, in living in traumatic and challenging circumstances, we're buying ourselves a strategic problem 10 years down the road when these children grow up and become radicalized. If we don't address this now, we're never going to really defeat ISIS or the many other extremist ideologies in the region. The ideology will continue well into the next generation and we're going to have to do this all over again. And that's not a prospect that I am actually uh, comfortable with. I had a little bit more than I wanted to say there, Katie, but Cody Bo, but I'm going to stop there so we can get to the questions. But I just wanted to call that out as something that I think is very important. And it might be a little unusual to have a combatant commander talk about it, but I think it's something that we just we need to address. 
and it won't be solved by this combatant command. It won't be solved by the Department of Defense, and it's not going to be solved by the United States alone. But we have a uh, we have a moment in time here where if we don't act, we're going to pay a heavy price down the road. Katie, both thank you, and I'm ready to take your questions. I, thank you, um, General McKenzie, and, and you know certainly that's been the the question of the the IDP camps, um, in particular in Syria, as well as the the SDF run prisons, has has been one of the most sort of intractable problem sets that I think both DoD and the State Department have been working on really for for years now. Um, and so I was hoping I wanted to follow up a little bit. I was hoping you could talk to me a little bit about the security situation with the with the prisons in particular. Um, you know, you mentioned obviously the the efforts to get some of the foreign fighters repatriated. Um, but at, at this point, you know, what is, is the SDF adequately resourced to safeguard some of these, these prisons, both for the foreign fighters and for the Syrian and Iraqi ISIS fighters, you know, many of which are kind of these jerry-rigged, you know, former schoolhouses and, and that kind of thing. Um, so what is the current assessment of kind of the, the security situation specifically with the prisoners? Sure. The I would say today our SDF partners in Eastern Syria uh, hold about 10,000 ISIS fighters at various uh, detention facilities, including 2,000 foreign fighters that we would categorize as hardcore, hardcore foreign terrorist fighters. Many of these of uh, the 10,000 are actually of Iraqi nationality uh, that are held in these prisons. So we do not actually provide any direct, any direct, any direct control of these prisons. This is done by the SDF. We participated in training them in the past, and a variety of other organizations also help us maintain it. Look, it is a uh, it's a tenuous control, but it is control. There have been uh, there have been uh, revolts in these prisons. There have not been major outbreaks. I am concerned about it. The long term solution has to be repatriation. These people have to go back to the countries with which they have nationality, and those countries need to claim them. And that has been a slow process to date. You know, we push it very hard. I know the Department of State works it very hard. Uh, the coronavirus concerns have slowed this down a little bit, but we need to continue aggressively pushing it. There's no long-term good solution by keeping them in Syria. Uh, they need to go back from whence they came, and we will, you know, we'll do everything we can to support that solution. Um, well, we may. I'm hoping to come back to Syria if we have we have time here. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of kick on with with some other questions. We got a lot of different um, countries and a lot of different areas of interest to to cover in a short amount of time. So, I want to start. Um, I want to start with um, Afghanistan. The U.S. is expected to draw down to 2,500 troops by January 15th, and I'm hoping you can try to help us paint a little bit of a picture about what that might look like. So, if you can talk to me a little bit about what capabilities are you going to lose at that level? You know, what are you not going to be able to do that we were doing before? And, and do you anticipate that the United States could go below that level and still achieve meaningful counterterrorism goals in Afghanistan? Sure. So let me first of all say very clearly, we're on path to be at 2,500 by the 15th of January, and we will make that date. We've been directed to do that by the president, so we're on, we're on a path to do that, and we'll have no trouble getting to that number. And we will also bring out equipment uh, so that we don't have excess equipment in there at that time. Now, clearly, when you go to 2,500, you're going to have to care be careful and choose what you do and what you don't do. But one point I want to make is our NATO and coalition partners are going to be with us even as we go down. In fact, there will probably there will be more coalition and NATO forces in Afghanistan than U.S. forces when we arrive at this number. So it's not just the United States that's going to be in Afghanistan. Rather, it's going to be a community of interest that sees the threat that could emanate from there. So we just need to bear that in mind as we think about what we're doing in Afghanistan. Now, as to what we can and can't do, we will be able to continue our focused CT operations as necessary. We will also be able to support our Afghan partners in their focused CT operations uh, when, those are, when those are indicated through either ISR, through fires, and through other things that we do to support them. We're just going to have to be very careful uh, and focused when we do it. And I think that embodies sort of General Miller's approach. We will do focused advising at a, at a higher level. And, and actually, the Afghans are doing the fighting now. We're not doing the fighting now. Um, so we will do it at a higher level. We will have to be very careful and very smart how we pick and choose where we go and where we don't go. And the margins will be less, but we believe it still will enable us to carry out our core objective, which as you know, is to prevent ISIS or Al Qaeda from basing in ungoverned spaces in Afghanistan and generating attacks against our homeland or the homeland of our allies and partners. And this will give us the capability to do that, even at a number of 2,500. 
When this announcement was initially made, officials, officials said publicly that the conditions were met on the ground to permit a, a safe drawdown to 2,500 troops. But we didn't really get a whole lot of details at the time about what exactly those conditions were. And so I'm hoping you can talk to us with as much specificity as you are able. What were the key indicators that you needed to see met in order to feel comfortable at the 2,500 level? So Katie, what we really need to see, and these some of these things are still developing, I want to be very clear. We need to see inter, intra-Afghan negotiations or the APN, Afghan peace negotiations is I think the term of art that we're using now. We needed to see that go forward. And if perhaps it is going forward. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, be overly optimistic on this. They're meeting in Doha. They've agreed on, as you know, a terms of reference for continued for continued negotiations. It took a while to get to that point perhaps longer than it should have, but we have it now, and I believe the parties are now in negotiations, and that needs to be an Afghan to Afghan dialogue, and that is continuing, so that's a good sign. Uh, the, the Taliban has not conducted attacks against the United States or coalition forces. That's a good sign. What they have done, though, is they have continued to attack Afghan security forces, and that's not a good sign, and that needs to, they need to find a way to that, presumably through the dialogue that's going on right now, where that process can be changed and that violence can go down. The violence is still there, and it, it is still a matter of great concern to me. We need to see uh, understandable, auditable uh, intentions from the Taliban that they are not going to allow ISIS or Al Qaeda to operate within within the territory that they control. And that is still a process that's going forward, and we don't have a final solution on that either. So, you know, there are some good news here. There's certainly some things that, that that give us a small amount of optimism. There are things that are very concerning as we go forward. You know, I was going to bring up the the Taliban Al Qaeda relationship because obviously uh, Taliban re renouncing Al Qaeda was one of the key precepts of um, of the the February deal that the United States made with the Taliban. But you know, this withdrawal has continued to pace. The 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 planning for for the withdrawal has continued. You know, are we not signaling to the Taliban and to Afghanistan generally that we're out uh, no matter what, no matter what what conditions are look like on the ground? Uh, Katie Bo, that's not a military question. Uh, you know, I, I would tell you this: we're 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 on a we're going to go to 2,500, and I will get further guidance at that at that point in time. I would tell you this, uh, and you you do make a very good point. Uh, it, the Taliban may believe they're on the cusp of a military victory. I read a lot of intelligence. I look at it. We believe, though, that our Afghan partners, with our support and our funding of the ASFF, the Afghan Security Assistance Fund, and with uh, and with our NATO and coalition partners. They can they can maintain a uh, they can maintain a defense against the Taliban even if we are at 2,500 at a lower level. We believe that is a practical way forward. Might not be you know where you want to be, but I think it is a practical way forward, and I think it's something that's very defensible. I want to follow up on on something that you said in a congressional testimony in the House in March. Um, you told House Armed Services lawmakers that the United States was providing quote very limited support to the Taliban in the fight against ISIS. Can you give us any details about what kind of support we're talking about here? Was there any coordination on a given strike? What did that look like? Yeah, I, I would tell you this without going into too much detail. Uh, this is several months ago. Uh, Taliban, op the, the Taliban and, and ISIS, as you know, have a theological dispute. They are intractable enemies, and uh, and so whatever they whatever the Taliban does or does or doesn't do with Al Qaeda they will actually pressure ISIS. And we have seen evidence of that uh, going forward. So it's sometimes in the past when, when the Taliban was conducting operations in Eastern uh, Afghanistan against ISIS, we had the opportunity to take a strike against ISIS formations. We would take that strike. We did not do it in coordination with the Taliban. And it would be uh, too large a use of the word to say that we had coordinated with the Taliban on that. But it was a common enemy. It was an opportunity to, uh, to strike someone who is an implacable foe of the United States. We did it. It probably helped the Taliban. Uh, and, and that would be the way I would describe it. Is there any kind of ongoing um, activities that are similar to that now? Or was that kind of a one off? Uh, the situation was unique then in that you had the uh, what you had was ISIS holding ground in Nangarhar and in eastern uh, Afghanistan. So when they hold ground, it's very easy to do those kinds of strikes. Now, the, uh, ISIS is not able to hold ground. So those conditions don't exist anymore. So I would say that's not what's happening now. Right. Um, one other sort of long-term story uh, that I wanted to follow up on is um, the latest we heard I, I, from you, I believe in September, um, you said that you had still not seen evidence to establish that Russia had paid bounties to the Taliban to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan. Uh, Congress obviously, obviously still cares. The NDAA that just passed in the House includes a yearling 
report, yearly reporting provision on this matter. Is that investigation still ongoing or has it been closed? And if so, what were the findings? Sure, so it is not closed because we never close investigations that involve you know, threats, potential threats against US forces. I've just, nothing has changed since my position of last September. We just have not been able to prove it. We don't see it. We look all the time very closely at potential threats to our forces in Afghanistan. I do, uh, General Scott Miller, our commander in Afghanistan do. We talk about this all the time. I relentlessly query my intelligence people on this. We just don't see it. Uh, but it's not because we're not looking at it. We're looking at it very hard. Um, I want to turn to Iraq now, where the United States is also drawing down to, to 2,500 troops by January 15th. Um, just give us a quick nugget overview of what the status of that withdrawal is. On sure. So, so I would tell you, just like in Afghanistan, we are on a glide slope to deliver the directed level of 2,500 by the 15th of January. We'll make that with no problem. Now, at, at the same time, it will allow us to continue our activities in, um, in Iraq, much as we are doing now. And again, there's a good news story. Our coalition and NATO partners are gonna be with us. The NATO Mission Iraq, which is a institutional level capacity build, defense security capacity building organization, we believe is gonna expand and we're gonna work with NATO uh, as they bring in more people to help us in there. So there's actually a couple of good things going on. I would also note, Katie, Bo, there's, been, there's been discussion here recently about drawdown of the US Embassy. That is a small drawdown, it's a drawdown. Uh, the ambassador is gonna remain. And it's just with increased threat reporting and the period that we're going into, including the one year anniversary of the death of Kasim Soleimani, just felt it was a it was a smart thing to do to reduce our attack surface. It does not reflect, a, not designed to reflect, to the best of my knowledge, a long term reduction in diplomatic capacity in Baghdad, but what, rather just a smart uh, judgment made based on the threats that we see out there right now. Let me emphasize again, the ambassador will remain, core embassy, core embassy functions will remain. I, well, speaking of the the anniversary of of the the killing of Qasem Soleimani, which obviously is coming up, uh, you know, are is the United States right now aware of any current planning by either Iran or its proxies operating in Iraq to either take advantage of the U.S. withdrawal to launch further attacks or to to act in in retaliation for for the Soleimani killing? So, and, and how much so you'll, you'll you'll understand. I'm not going to be able to go into much detail on that. I would just tell you this: we watch all these threat streams closely all the time. We monitor forces in the theater. I'm in an active discussion all the time with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and with the Secretary of Defense on what forces we need to deter Iran, because that is our intent, to convince them that it is not in their interest to lash out. It is not in their interest to attack us, either directly or indirectly. And by indirectly, I mean through proxies. And the probable place that would happen is, as you noted, in Iraq. So we want them to know it's not in their interest to do that. And to date, I think we have achieved a certain level of what I call contested deterrence. Uh, it's not perhaps perfect, but I think they see it's not in their interest to do that. And that is, that's sort of the military element of it. There are a lot of other political and diplomatic elements of it, but my concern is principally the security and the military element. I, how concerned are you that um, some of these sort of Iranian proxies operating in Iraq might take it on themselves to, to take action without the explicit permission or, or blessing of Tehran? Good question, and we are very concerned about that. You know, here's the one thing about the U.S. military, and, and if I give an order, it's going to be followed. I have complete confidence in the chain of command. Uh, the, the, down at the lowest level, people will do what I ask them to do. That does not apply uh, in the Iranian system or in the Iranian proxy system. And I think there's a degree of dissonance there that you just got to watch. Now, the problem is that Iran has given these uh, proxies which they have some, in some very good degree of control over. Others, as you noted, perhaps less, they've given them very capable weapons. And we will know where those weapons came from. They're not gonna be able to conceal that. So Iran is gonna own a measure of responsibility regardless of how this happens. But I think that is a, that's, a, that's a key point. The one thing I would tell you though, that we are very pleased to see is the government of Iraq is actually very active in working to reduce threats against us. Prime Minister Kadimi and his team uh, have done a lot of very good things to reduce threats to U.S. and coalition forces in around Baghdad, but also across the country writ large. So we're very pleased with that. And that shows, I think it's a good indicator of the way the two nations are working together. I, it's been it's been almost a year since since the Soleimani killing, as we as we referenced. Uh, you know, what have you learned in the intervening months about his successor, General Esmail Ghani? So I would say this, they miss Kasim Soleimani. Uh, he was a he was a powerful figure in their in their uh, in their system. He had direct access to the supreme leader. He used that. He was decisive. Um, 
the, the man who's come behind him is perhaps not so good at communications, doesn't have those skills, and I think they're paying a price for it. And I think it's just a, in, in a system where one person can remain for over 10 or 15 years doing these things, you tend to get that kind of activity and you see what happens then when you lose that person. And, uh, and they're seeing it now. I think they are still actually digesting uh, the reality of him, not, of Soleimani, not, not, no longer being around, no longer being able to give advice. Can you expand on that a little bit? You said you think they're paying a price for not having him in there. What's, yeah. what's the price? The price is that it's hard for them to coordinate things. Yeah. Uh, I think, I'll give you an example. I think that uh, they would have liked to have seen a political solution to push uh, the United States and the coalition out of Iraq in the spring and summer of this year. Uh, Iran was not able to achieve that. Uh, and I think that might have been because of their inability to bring all the groups together under a single leader in, in Iraq. And I think that's a clear example of it right there. And there are other things, and we should never... Uh, underestimate the role of the Iraqi people themselves and their desire to choose their own political leaders. But I think the fact that Qasem Soleimani is no longer there to bang heads together and to force people often against their will to go away they might not have wanted to go, I think that's something that, uh, that Iran and the proxies miss very much. I just sort of zooming out broadly, you know, we're, we're in this transition period in the United States. How do you anticipate that Iran will behave kind of in the waning months of one administration awaiting an incoming new administration? Sure. So, you know, I said a few minutes ago, uh, Katie Bo, that I thought we had achieved contested deterrence. And that's how we would describe it. I think Iran recognizes that we're willing to act and we will act if, if we're attacked, if our, if our friends or friends or friends in the region are attacked. I think we're willing to do that. It's been very clear to them. So they understand that now. At the same time, I think there's still pressure to uh, avenge the death of Soleimani. I still think there's a desire to eject us from the theater. And that remains a long term aspirational goal for them. Those things compete. And it's very hard sometimes almost opaque to look into the highest levels of Iranian decision making and try to understand it. And I don't I don't claim to be an expert on that. I'm actually very humble in my own ability to judge what the Iranians will do or will not do. But I can just look at what's happened. And we have achieved a form of deterrence. I would like that form of deterrence to, to, to go as long as it can. It may be that part of the Iranian calculation is they want to wait until the 20th of January and see what happens. I don't know. Uh, that would be fine with me if, if, as long as nothing happens. And we'll just have to see how that plays out. But I think, we, uh, I think we have achieved that form of deterrence. I keep coming back to that. We managed to do it, I believe, by uh, keeping an appropriate level of forces in the theater, forces that are un clearly enough to defend and if necessary to strike back, but at the same time, not enough to be provocative and to add, uh, and to add temperature to what is already a very dangerous situation. So we managed that very carefully. You know, in addition, obviously, to the Soleimani killing, uh, we've also just in recent weeks seen the killing of a key architect of Iran's nuclear program um, in an assassination that Iran has blamed on, on Israel. I, what, is, what response have you seen um, to, to that? And, and have there been any recent threats to either the U.S. or its Gulf allies in, in response specifically to, to that killing? Sure. So, I, I, again, I think, uh, I think Iran feels that very keenly. I think they're embarrassed by it. I think they're searching for a way to respond. Um, but their process is often slow and often not completely synchronized. So I think they're still working what that's going to be. Would they like to probably hit back against Israel? I think so, yes. Uh, but they haven't been able to do it yet. I don't know that they will or they won't. Uh, and as you know, they often associate us with it, whether we had anything to do with it or not. And, and I mean, we certainly didn't, but, but it doesn't matter what I think. It's what they think. And that's, a, and that's something that I think we're going to pay great attention to. The last thing I would just say on that is we look at all kinds of threats all the time across the theater. And, uh, and you know, we, we pay attention to those threats. We've learned the hard way never to take those lightly. You know, you've just got to dig into them and understand them. I want to go back to Syria. We talked obviously a little bit about um, about the IDP situation earlier, and I want to sort of return to the to the conflict writ large. Um, I, you know, the Pentagon has been reluctant, obviously, to disclose exactly what the U.S. force presence looks like in Syria. A former DISIS envoy, um, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, recently told me that the troop levels there were a quote shell game designed to obscure exactly how many people the U.S. has there. Can you, as best as you're able, describe for us the current U.S. posture there and tell us why the exact number of troops there is classified in a way that it's not in Afghanistan or, or Iraq? So publicly, we say we got around 900 troops on the ground there. That number sometimes goes down, sometimes goes up. Mm -hmm. No shell game play. I have to report in writing to Congress, 
and my chain of command exactly what those proof numbers are. So I, I know Ambassador Jeffrey very well, and I, I appreciate his comment on that. But th you can't play a shell game because I'm bound by reporting requirements where I have to say where everybody is. So that number is reported and very clearly to, to all the oversight organizations that take a look at where we are. So I just like to make that make that point at the beginning. But the, this but in, your larger question. We are positioned on an arc really from Antof Garrison in the south of uh, in the southwest of, of Syria, just north of the Jordanian border, where we have an outpost, then up the Euphrates River, generally along the line of the Euphrates River in an area to the east that we call the Eastern Syria Security Area. There, we are partnered with our SDF uh, partners, who actually are the people that are carrying out combat operations against ISIS. So that the force is disposed to do that. And that's the way we actually put them on the ground. I'm not going to talk at a lower level about where they are, but you will understand that. Now, a couple of months ago, we had an opportunity to bring armor up there when we had a, uh, the Russians uh, actually had a patrol go out of its sector into an area that was not coordinated with us. We didn't give them permission to do it. And we felt it was appropriate to show a little more uh, teeth up there. So we brought a Bradley platoon, an M2 Bradley platoon, which is an armored fighting vehicle. And I've kept those up there and I continually revisit that. Do we want to keep them up there? It just shows that we're determined to ensure that the men and women we put on the ground up there have the protection they need to carry out the tasks that we've assigned them to do. And the last thing I would say is there's discussion about us uh, defending oil, oil fields. The SDF defend the oil fields. We enable them to defend the oil fields. And the oil fields we hold for a couple of reasons. One, to prevent ISIS from getting to them because it was a valuable stream of res revenue for them during the life of the caliphate. And second, it actually helps the SDF accrue accrue finances and may actually regenerate some form of a, a nascent economy in eastern Syria, which is a priority for us as well. I want to I want to zoom out a little bit on the, the Syria picture. What is the long term plan here? I mean, is the idea that this will essentially be kind of a, as some officials have described it to me, sort of a permanent U.S. deployment, either in perpetuity as the conflict kind of settles into a de facto stalemate or as a potential peace process lurches along? Sure. So there's actually a UN Security Council resolution that talks about what the future in Syria should be, and that's 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 where that's what we subscribe to. It needs to be, and it needs to be one where uh, people's voices are heard. Uh, clearly, uh, it would require an adjustment from the government in uh, in Damascus in order to make that happen. It would require serious negotiations between them and the Kurds in the east. Those types of things need to happen, uh, and and you know the, the government of Damascus has shown no particular sign of wanting to take those steps. Uh, but I think that's the way forward. It's got to be a political solution. You know, I, I, the decision to keep U.S. forces long term in Syria is not a military decision. That is uniquely a policy decision by civilian policymakers at the highest levels of the United States. So I don't know what that decision would be going forward. But I can tell you that there's, there's not a clear military solution. But I would add this. The conditions that gave rise to ISIS exist in Western Syria just as they exist in some of the uh, IDP camps that we've talked about. And unless we find a way to provide stabilization for those elements, it's, the problem is not gonna go away. East of, the, east of the Euphrates River, where we are, we have those stabilization mechanisms in place with our SDF partners. West of the Euphrates River, they are largely absent because the Russians and the Syrians have no concept of how to do this kind of stabilization and they're not interested in it. So the conditions are at least as bad as the conditions that fomented the original rise of ISIS back several years ago. So that it, we should be concerned by that. We got just uh, under a minute left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get out of here with just one more question. And I'm sorry, I can't let you escape without asking you a quick transition question, which is have you briefed President-elect Biden or his team yet? So uh, there's a, formal process uh, for the transition. And, uh, and it's handled, I actually, as a, as a younger officer, I was part of that process for, for uh, President Obama when he came in and, and, uh, and his administration came in. So I'm very familiar with that process. It's jointly managed by the joint staff, by, the, by, the, by OSD, and by the incoming transition team. And as part of that process, all combatant commanders have an opportunity to engage. And I have been engaged, as many others have. And that's, I thought it was a very good process, very well supported by the department and very well supported by, uh, by, the, by the president elect's team. Great, well, thank you so much, General McKenzie, for, for taking so much time with us today. This was a very informative conversation. That is 
all the time we've got uh, have left today. But um, to those of you watching, uh, to those of you watching online, be sure to stay tuned for a word from our exclusive underwriter Cisco, uh, and be sure to join us on December fifteenth at eleven a.m. Eastern Standard for our next event in the Outlook twenty twenty one series, the After Trump and Awaiting Biden: What Now for Conservatives in National Security panel discussion, which is featuring Richard Fontaine, Chief Executive at CNAS, and Corey Shockey, the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at AEI. Um, again, thank you so much to everyone who joined us and thank you, General McKenzie, for, for your time today. Thank you, Katie Bo. Take care. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye. Some of the issues as outlined by various senior leaders across DOD is bridging the tactical edge to the enterprise environment, supporting episodic demands, building resilient infrastructure to scale uh, technology, and addressing data silos. So I'm Sean, I'm hoping you can help uh, start by just telling us what are some of your thoughts on how Cisco can help DOD address these particular challenges? Yes, so the goal is to enable mission success without the worries of technology. Technology should enable the mission and not be a hindrance. The recently published DOD, strategy, DOD data strategy vision statement highlights that the DOD, the DOD is a data-centric organization. It uses data at speed and scale for operational advantage and increased efficiency. Additionally, it recognizes that data is a strategic asset and therefore it must be operationalized. Having said that, it's critical to take a platform approach when talking about edge to, edge to cloud, and you must build a foundation when you're gonna operationalize data. Cisco's <laughs> approach is to help the DOD build a foundational platform for their operations. We recognize that to do that, to provide all of the necessary, we do not provide all the necessary pieces and parts and solutions or parts that go into the solution. We know that the DOD is going to operate in a multi-vendor environment. And these are similar challenges that we see facing all of our customers, not just the DOD. It's why Cisco's made it a priority to really develop solutions with open APIs to support third-party integrations. It's also why Cisco's made um, an, an investment to establish a DevNet community. So let me ask you this, Sean, can you share with our audience like a, a particular example or examples of Cisco enabling multi-vendor interoperability? Yeah, so uh, there's two good examples. Um, so the first is our Cisco HCSD, and that's a hosted cloud collaboration solution and it's impact level five. And it's the only impact level five collaboration solution available to the DoD today. It is an open standard cloud option and it allows for seamless integration of, into Microsoft. So it allows them to deliver demand collab collaboration capabilities to ser service members. Because it's a cloud offering, it offers flexibility, simplicity, and most, most important, affordability. It allows for faster deployment of new services as most cloud solutions do. The second example is really around security and zero trust. We, we all hear the importance of, and the DOD's focused on a zero trust architecture. Cisco's zero trust architecture secures connections of applications, microservices, or containers, regardless if they reside in a data center or a cloud or in the soon to be uh, Microsoft Jedi cloud. Um, and knowing that the security architectures were always going to be multi-vendor, Cisco developed an exchange grid called PX Grid. And so what PX Grid allows DODs, uh, the DOD to do is to really integrate multiple security products um, and then allows them to have the ability to share data and work together. This will be a key to the DOD as they move forward with the zero trust architecture. So, we, so we you mentioned. That, oh, I was gonna add on to that. We recognize that all of our solutions are gonna reside in multi-vendor multi environments. Uh, as we just mentioned with security. We've made a significant investment in the DevNet platform, which I'm in community environment and community, what I mentioned earlier. Um, and this allows third-party unique government solutions uh, to be easily integrated into the Cisco platforms. And the I'm commitment to the oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Dale. No, that's quite all right. Go ahead. Um, so we, our commitment to DevNet can be shown by the we've in, We've introduced certifications for our DevNet environments into our Cisco networking academies. And the services use our Cisco networking academies as part of their formal training process. Got it. That's what I was going to ask about on the on DevNet on that front. Um, does DevNet provide an interoperability platform other than security? 
because you're using that as an example. Absolutely. It supports numerous platforms, including networking, IoT, mobility, data center, and collaboration, which I had mentioned earlier. Great. So, Sean, give me an example of a DOD customer leveraging these capabilities. I'm sure um, our audience wants to hear about um, those uh, those you know pilots out there or programs that are that are operating right now. So, absolutely. So, the first one that comes to mind is the virtual pilot ship within the Navy, and that's. Uh, they're looking at the weapon systems on the Aegis class submarine, and they use the Cisco platform, which is essentially a cloud um, deployed on the ship. And it's an open standard software based um, platform that allows integration with all solutions and allows to give them capabilities to the sailors um, seamlessly and, and to build ad hoc services. Um, and so it's currently been deployed on an Aegis class ship and is out for testing as we speak. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about 5G lately. I know um, at Defense One, we're certainly covering it a lot and plan to be discussing it into 2021. Um, how does Cisco play in 5G for the Department of Defense? That's a great question. So obviously it's been top of mind in the DoD and it's also very much top of mind for Cisco. Um, often when folks think about 5G, they think about the, uh, the RF component of it or the radio frequency component. And what 5G does is it really in increases the, the ability to deliver capabilities out at the edge, but it also allows for um, co additional capacity. So adding a lot more connected devices. Think Internet of Things, right? It's a big, big place there. With the increase in capacity and the number of actually the increase in the number of connected um, devices, the question becomes is will their infrastructure be able to support or provide security and agility to support these additional connected connections? And what Cisco brings together is our software divine capability in the networking, along with private G, private 5G, to provide the robust platform that will improve the productivity and efficiency in the critical operations. We're currently engaged in supporting initiatives in 5G in areas around manufacturing today. Uh, you know, in, in some of the other areas where it's going to be very, um, it's going to be, it's going to help uh, provide solutions to be around warehousing, shipyards, and depots. Sean, to bring us full circle, and I, I know you mentioned um, IBN or intent-based networking. Um, how does um, IBN enable DoD interoperability? Yeah, so an architectural approach uh, driven by intent-based networking, and we talked a little bit about earlier about operationalizing data, um, is, is really around the mission thread from the edge to the cloud. And this integrated approach will enable the DoD to better manage and control the resiliency, security, and performance when you start talking about delivering services to the edge all the way from the cloud. It helps assure the delivery of highly reliable, available services the DoD requires for, for successful uh, missions. Well, Sean, I think you and I could probably spend uh, hours talking about this. There's just so much um, to cover, but I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with me today and share your insights with our audience. I think it's been a very valuable conversation. I certainly learned something, um, and I want to thank Cisco for supporting this year's Defense One's Outlook 2020 as our elite underwriter. Today's program certainly would not be possible without their partnership. Um, many thanks to our audience for being with us today. We encourage you to tune in to our other Defense One Outlook sessions and share them with your colleagues who might be interested. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Daniela.